This week we're studying how energy flows in biological systems. To understand how energy flows, first we need to understand the universal laws that determine how energy changes. These laws are called the laws of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics states that no energy can be created or destroyed. It can only change in form, so it can, for instance, be transformed from potential energy into kinetic energy. Living organisms use potential energy stored in chemical bonds to form new chemical bonds or to convert it into other forms of energy such as movement of kinetic energy. During each conversion of energy, some of that initial energy is lost as heat, which cannot be used by cells. This brings us to the second law of thermodynamics, which states that some energy is lost as heat or random molecular motion or disorder, which is called entropy. The universe is, con is continuously increasing in disorder, or in other words, entropy is always increasing. To understand what entropy is, we look at a familiar example, such as the disorder that occurs in our room. Entropy will be the, the room becoming more and more disorganized as time goes by with no effort. On the other hand, to return to an organized and tidy room, it requires energy and it requires time and effort to put everything back together and straighten things up. So this is the example of entropy, where entropy happens spontaneously, but going back to an organized pattern requires energy input. This means that energy is constantly being lost by entropy, and to so we need a supply of energy that will restore that energy lost. That constant supply comes from the sun. And the energy from the sun can be harvested by organisms capable of doing photosynthesis, such as plants and algae and photosynthetic prokaryotes. During photosynthesis, these organisms take the energy in the sun and form complex molecules such as sugars, which contain bonds with high energy. Then other organisms can consume those molecules and harvest the energy contained in those bonds to perform other tasks. The energy in general terms is the capacity to do work. Store energy or potential energy can then be released as kinetic energy or another form of energy that does the work. For example, the potential energy of the girl at the top of the slide can be converted into kinetic energy as she slides down. Likewise, Living organisms can use potential energy stored in chemical bonds to do other types of work. During chemical reactions, the energy of a molecule is passed to another molecule in the form of an electron. The molecule that loses an electron is called to be oxidized, and the molecule that gains an electron is called to be reduced. Oxidation and reduction always take place together. As one molecule loses an electron and becomes oxidized, the electron is transferred to another molecule, which in turn becomes reduced. As expected from the first law of thermodynamics, the energy lost by one molecule is gained by another molecule. However, some of the energy is lost to entropy, as stated by the second law of thermodynamics. The amount of energy that is transferred depends on the energy of the electron that is transferred. Not all electrons have the same amount of energy. Electrons that are closer to the nucleus of the atom have less energy than those located farther apart. When an electron moves closer to the nucleus, it releases energy, as it moves from a high energy state to a low energy state. On the other hand, when an electron moves farther away from the nucleus, it requires the input of energy, as the electron is moving from a low energy state to a high energy state. So in the analogy presented here, an electron moving closer to the nucleus is kind of moving downstairs, while an electron moving farther away from the nucleus is moving upstairs and it requires energy. The energy contained by a molecule can be calculated by the energy contained in its bonds, which is called enthalpy and is designated by the letter H. However, not all the energy in the bonds is available to do work. Some of that energy is lost to the disorder in the system, which is the term Ts where S is the degree of entropy and T is the temperature of the system. The energy remaining, or the energy that will be available to do work, is called free energy 
and is designated by the letter G from Jupe's free energy. During a chemical reaction, as some bonds break and form new ones, the energy, there will be a release of energy or there will be an amount of energy that will be absorbed by the reaction. And this is denoted by the change in free energy, which is the difference in the free energy of the products versus the reagents. So for example, if the products have less energy than the reagents, the reaction released energy, and this will be a, denoted as a decrease in Gibbs free energy, and this reaction is called exergonic, so it releases energy. On the other hand, if the products have more energy than the reagents, that means energy was absorbed, or it required the input of energy, and this will be reflected as an increase in free energy, or a positive delta G. This type of reaction is called endergonic, as it requires energy input. This will become more clear in the following um, graph here. The products, as you see, have more energy than the reactants. This is on the y-axis, we have the free energy in the, in the molecules. And the, the products, they gain energy, and that energy must have been supplied from somewhere. So that means there was an input en of energy and as a result, we have a positive delta G as the products have higher energy than the reagents, than the uh, reactants. This is an endergonic reaction. On the other hand, if the products have less free energy than the reactants, that means that energy is released during the reaction. This is an exergonic reaction. It has now a negative change in delta G. As energy is released and now we have products that have less energy than the reactants. Cells couple endergonic reactions, those that require energy, to exergonic reactions, those that release energy. So then they use the energy released by the exergonic reaction to power the endergonic one. ATP is commonly used by cells to power endergonic reactions and to do other types of work in the cell. The hydrolysis of ATP, or the breaking down of ATP into ADP, an inorganic phosphate, or its further breakdown into adenosine monophosphate, releases enough energy to perform any task in the cell. So let's look at the structure of the ATP molecule. It has an AMP core, which is formed by an adenine, and a ribose, and a phosphate. This is um, sort of a nucleotide base. And then if we add a second phosphate group, now we have ADP, which is adenosine diphosphate. And if we add a third phosphate group, now we have adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. And you can see that these bonds between the phosphates have high amount of energy. This is because the phosphates are highly negative. They have multiple oxygen atoms, which are highly negative. So imagine... This is like having powerful magnets joined by the negative ends and hold by a thin band. As long as, as soon as the band that is holding them together is cut, you can imagine the magnets will quickly and forcibly move apart from each other. And this is the energy that will then be used by the cell to perform all the tasks. The energy released by ATP hydrolysis can be used to power endergonic cellular processes. We hydrolyze ATP to form ADP and inorganic phosphate. But then the cells need to restore ADP back to ATP, and this will require the input of energy. And that energy is supplied by other exergonic reactions. Next week, we will study the process by which cells harvest energy from other molecules, such as glucose, and use that energy to restore ATP from ADP. Cells are constantly cycling between ATP and ADP. They're using ATP for the regular activities, and they're harvesting energy from other molecules to restore the ATP that was used. In the following resources this week, you will learn more about the molecule of ATP, how cells use enzymes to catalyze chemical reactions, and the common principles of chemical pathways involved in metabolism.